All right, I think we can get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for waking up early on this Monday morning to be here. Um, my name is Yuriko Anaba. I'm a lead engineer at Horizon Labs, and today we'll be talking about the journey of cobalt. Um, here's the agenda for this session. So first, uh, let's introduce what cobalt is. Um, next, the bulk of the time, we'll be talking about uh, how we went from the idea of cobalt to the product we have now. And then finally, uh, we'll touch on what's next for cobalt. Um, cobalt is Horizon's first web wallet extension. Um, and it supports the token mint sidechain in the Horizon ecosystem. And if you don't have Cobalt yet, you can go to the Chrome Web Store um, and download it so you can use it yourselves. Um, so here are some of the contributors to um, Cobalt specifically. But before I begin, I also want to thank um, the entire team uh, that made uh, Cobalt possible and Token Mint possible. Uh, so thank you to Angie, John, Zane, and the entire engineering team. Um, current and former, who are part of building out Token Mint. So this includes Carlos, Sean, Tomas, Jofra, Ben, Lou, um, Palosi, Davide, Marco, um, and also the Infra team. And apologies if I missed anyone. And I wanted to start with a quick story of how it all began. Um, so at the end of last year in 2021, we knew we wanted to build a, a wallet for our sidechain. Um, and the initial proposal we received was, you know, build a simple wallet that would work with this new sidechain that we'll build um, and take a look at my Zen wallet and see if we can improve on it or expand on it uh, to see, uh, to get to do what we wanted to do. Um, so this is what my Zen wallet looks like. It's a web page wallet. Um, and it was something created by a community member over a weekend. Um, so I think the thinking was, if this can be created over a weekend, can we create a sidechain wallet over a weekend? And at the time, we weren't very knowledgeable about um, why webs, uh, a lot of wallets were web extensions. Um, so if you look at MetaMask, Yoroi, Phantom, Coinbase, they all have extension versions of their wallet. So we also thought about porting this into an extension version and seeing how that would turn out. Um, and we did that over an afternoon and it worked. Um, but there were also other considerations. So for example, the UI for this is not ideal. Every time you want to use the wallet, you need to imp uh, input your 12 word seed phrase, uh, which could be uh, pretty annoying. And we also took out the code itself. Uh, it was relatively simple and straightforward. So it wouldn't be difficult to replicate uh, what we have here by starting from scratch. So in other words, um, there was no need to build on top of this, but we can take uh, anything that, uh, we can copy over anything that would be useful into a new wallet and start from scratch. So we abandoned the idea of using MyZen Wallet as a base altogether um, and decided to invest the time and effort to build a product we can be proud of and have a long-term vision for. Uh, so now let's start talking about how we went from the idea of Cobalt to the Cobalt wallet we have now. Um, there are several steps to take uh, to build products, starting with ideation. So the first step is gathering the business requirements. Uh, product plays a big role at this stage, uh, but also engineers have a strong voice in what we're building. Uh, so we're already involved at this initial stage as well. So here we're... Um, defining what we want to build and also asking yourselves why we want to build this. Uh, next is the technical planning. So before actually actual coding begins, uh, we'll look at what we want to build and how we will build it. We'll also consider how long it will take to build. Uh, so if anything looks too complex, we might um, de-scope the project or offer alternative ideas. Um, next is the actual implementation and testing. And finally, if everything looks good, uh, we'll launch the product. Uh, so what was the business requirements for Cobalt? Uh, the initial scope of what, co uh, of what we wanted uh, with this wallet was very limited. Uh, the, the idea was to build an MVP, a minimal viable product. 
um, and an MVP is the simplest product that would uh, do what we needed. So for the wallet, this meant um, that we would support tokens, but we only needed to support one token, which would have been the Zenny token. Um, we also needed the wallet to generate addresses and um, also import addresses that would work with the sidechain. Uh, we wanted the wallet to show Zenny balances and Zenny transactions. And then finally, the wallet would need to be able to send and receive um, any Zenny transactions as well. Um, as to the why, the wallet is the gateway to any sidechain or any sidechain platform. With the launch of Zendu, we were able to build sidechains, and sidechains, building sidechains meant increasing the capabilities of the Horizon ecosystem. Um, we, just, we decided to build a tokenization platform, which would allow us to issue and manage uh, tokens, both fungible and non-fungible. Um, and with that, we would need a wallet so we can easily interact with the sidechain. Um, also, creating a browser extension wallet meant um, this was our first step towards uh, Web3. So once the what and the why are defined, we start with the technical planning. At this stage, the engineers take a look at how we would build the product. So for the web wallet, um, Lou and I, we work together um, to understand the task at hand and break it down into ind individual parts that need to be implemented. Together, we produce the technical specification document or a tech spec. And we try to account for everything we can think of, any edge cases, anything that can go wrong, um, anything that we should account for now for anything down the line potentially. And having this document is important uh, so it can be shared around uh, for feedback and comments. Uh, it's also used as a reference when we are implementing the product. And then we can ensure everything that needs to be accounted for is thought through. Um, we wanted to make sure we understood the fundamentals and revisited some, uh, some of the ideas of what a wallet is. So what does it do exactly? What are the core responsibilities of a wallet? Uh, we were thinking about you know, what distinguishes one wallet from another wallet. And we also knew wallets were responsible um, for storing sensitive information. So we were looking at security measures that needed to be taken uh, for, for this wallet. Um, we also wanted to make sure we understood some important key concepts around wallets that would be relevant for us. So um, we reread re up on some of these Bitcoin improvement pr proposals. So BAP32 introduces the idea of HC wallets, and then BAP39 introduces the idea of mnemonic phrases. Um, so just to explain a little bit about uh, these VAPs, um, BAP32 um, introduces a standard for HD wallets and extended keys. HD wallets or, or hierarchical wa deterministic wallets are wallets that use a single C to derive many private and public keys. Um, and the derivation of these keys are done in a deterministic way, which means um, given a particular seed, you will always get the same um, key pairs and addresses. An extended key is a key that can be used to derive child keys as part of this HD wallet. And elliptic curve mathematics allows us to derive public keys um, without necessarily having the private key, which is important. Uh, so this was significant for a few reasons. Uh, first, being able to recover an entire wallet with a single seed meant that you can um, um, use different clients for wallets and use them interchangeably. Um, second, this concept of um, this concept of extended keys uh, introduced or enabled these watch only wallets, meaning um, wallets that are only responsible for receiving funds. Um, so you could store your private key and publicly, public, public key separately and still be able to um, use a wallet for receiving funds. And maybe a good example that this might be useful for is an e-commerce site that receives payments in crypto. Um, they can store just the public key in their servers and generate different addresses for each order for each customer uh, without having to store the private key there as well. Um, next is BAP39. 
now that we had this concept of uh, deriving multiple keys from a single seed, it was important that this seed uh, was both safe but also easy uh, to remember. So BIP 39 uh, introduces this idea of using a mnemonic fr uh, phrase for the seed. Um, so the first step is to generate entropy. Um, that's 128 bits long uh, for a 12 word seed phrase. Um, next, you would take the hash of this, uh, hash of this, and the first four bits would be the checksum. Then you concatenate the entropy with the checksum, and then they are separated into 11 bits each. Um, these serve as indexes to a word list um, ranging from 0 to 2047. Uh, so there, uh, this word list is also part of the standard, and it contains 2048 words. Um, and there, there's a list for a lot of the languages, not just English. Um, and then finally, we convert uh, these numbers into words and put them together to create our mnemonic code. Um, and a BIP39 seed phrase created with um, the appropriate randomness cannot be um, recreated or um, guessed through brute force because there's just so many possible permutations of this. Um, also, as part of research and planning, we looked at other wallets, and a lot of them are open source, so we were able to look at um, the code itself to understand how they're storing data, but also how they're storing sensitive data as well. We looked at many wallets out there, but two in particular uh, that we focused on were MetaMask and also our own desktop wallet, Sphere. Uh, we also did research into the difference between building out a web page and building out a web extension um, because that was one of the decisions that uh, we were asked to made, make. Um, and we also needed to understand the different components of a browser extension and how, how they work. Um, another component that we had to plan was the architecture of token, the whole token platform um, and understand how Cobalt, um, or sorry, the wallet, uh, would interact with the side chains. And this diagram here shows um, the current architecture that we came up with. Uh, so we have several token mint nodes um, running. Uh, this con this, con this uh, creates uh, the token mint network. We also have a token mint block explorer, both a front end UI and a back end. Um, the back end uh, is running its own instance of the token mint node and also exposes a REST API which is what the wallet uses to get data about the sidechain um, to be able to display balances and tra transactions and also to send um, new transactions and broadcast them as well. Um, as front end engineers, we also pay attention to what the product will look like um, and think about what the end users will see. And because we were building an MVP product, um, we had very limited resources, um, so Lou and I, uh, we had put together our own mockups and wireframes using screenshots, um, and we had adjusted them to uh, what we needed. Um, and we called these our low fidelity UI mockups. Um, and uh, we eventually used um, a, comp a component library, and so there was some sort of consistent theming uh, throughout. Um, but it, it, was, it was very basic. Um, and later on in the presentation, you may see a glimpse of what the wallet looked like at the stage of, um, of the development. Uh, so next is implementation and testing. Uh, as we were implementing the wallet and, be, and it became a more real product, we got design resources um, to help uh, make it look better. Uh, thank you to Marco. Um, and in reality, design is always part of the development process because it's important for us to really think about how the product should look and also think about the user interactions. Um, as part of the improvements, we came up with an official name for the wallet. Um, at first, we were referring to it as the minimal web wallet. Um, it wasn't even a web wallet, it was a very minimal one. Um, but now it had an official name, Cobalt. Um, all our Horizon products are named after Zen elements, um, and the wallet falls under the Zen element of air or wind, 
um, and this represents communication and flow. Uh, the term cobalt also has a few meanings. So one is the color blue, which associates with air. I and mean, then also cobalt is a metal element, which also associates with one of the first forms of traditional currency, the coin. Um, also, we have this really cool logo for cobalt, um, and it's inspired by the Horizon logo. Um, with all our designs, we try to incorporate curves, circles, round shapes um, to represent connectedness within the, within the ecosystem um, and also a sense of openness. And Lucy and Marco were really fundamental in adding the branding uh, to our wallet e extension and really elevating the product. Um, so we went through the cycle of defining, planning, and implementing a few times. Um, as the product became more full-fledged, um, there were other features we wanted to add to help make the tokenization platform a more holistic experience. Um, so first, we knew that transactions on the token mint sidechain would uh, require Zen. So we had implemented um, a way to transfer Zen from the main chain to the sidechain. So uh, Cobalt now had forward transfer capabilities. Um, then we were thinking if they can transfer Zen from the main chain to sidechain, they should be able to transfer it back. Um, so we added support for backward transfers. Um, we also wanted to have support for multiple tokens, so not just the Zenny token, but any token generated um, on the sidechain. And then we also added a token generator component to the platform, uh, and this is a UI that helps uh, users uh, create and mint um, their own tokens. Um, and for that, that meant Cobalt had to connect to this wallet to be able to sign these transactions. Mm -hmm. Two okay. Um, for transactions, do you have to use Zen, or is there going to be a test Zen type currency available to use? Um, and second question, uh, and you can maybe wrap these together, mm -hmm. is who is your target for the target user? Yeah, so for the first question, um, so we have a main chain in this, um, or sorry, a main net and a test net environment. So in the main net environment, um, you use real Zen to pay for the transfer fees or transaction fees, sorry. Um, and, and in testnet, we have um, testnet Zenny or test, sorry, test Zen um, that are used to pay for the transfer fees. Um, and for this, the target audience, um, I think we were gen um, targeting the general community at this point. Um, and we weren't very specific about um, who, who would use this so far. Um, so another important part of the technical implementation was the implementation of the CICD pipeline. Um, and Yuri from the Infra team had built this for us, so shout out to him. Um, CICD stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment. Um, and this was something that was part of the initial tech spec that we knew um, we wanted to incorporate from the very beginning. Um, so CICD is this, this idea of small incremental but frequent delivery and automated deployments. So we had added automated tests. Um, so with that, um, any code changes, we had a level of confidence uh, that it was safe. Um, so we have an automated pipeline that runs these tests, and then if they pass, um, it triggers a build of the extension and also a submission to the Chrome Web Store. Uh, we also set up two extensions for the, uh, the Web Store, one for staging and one for production. So the staging one is a private one used for internal testing. And then the production one is the one that everyone um, can see, download, and use. Um, so we have uh, different pipelines for these two use cases as well. We also go through an audit process. Um, so an audit, auditing firm, Halborn, um, assesses our code to look for any security vulnerabilities. Um, their findings from our first audit of Cobalt included the demonic vulnerability, which I'll explain in the next slide. Um, they also uh, pointed out to us that we had not enforced a password strength policy, so we added that as well. 
And then thirdly, we should make, we should make sure to use um, maintain packages and also specify um, the exact versions of the packages that we're using. Um, so now I want to share um, two improvements that we made um, coming out of these testing and auditing uh, cycles. Uh, first is the fix to this demonic vulnerability that Hellborn found. Um, and this was also a vu vulnerability that they found in the MetaMask wallet as well, a few, a few months after they've looked at our wallet. Um, so browsers save um, contents of all non-password inputs um, in disk unencrypted. Uh, so that means if you have um, a seed phrase in a single text area, um, this could be stored on your computer. So um, if anyone has remote or physical access to your computer, they could search for something that looks like a seed phrase um, because it follows this BAP39 standard. Um, so initially we had simplified the development um, and verifying the seed phrase during wallet creation meant just typing it in in a single text area, which is what you see on, on the left there. Um, however, with the audit findings, uh, we saw that there were some issues with the, this approach. And so we implemented the word selection UI. Um, this is a UI that's actually common in a lot of wallets. And uh, from this audit, we were able to realize why a lot of um, wallets use this approach. And then another fun fact that we learned slash realized was um, you can have the same word multiple times in a single seed phrase. And during this implementation, we had tested so many, um, this flow so many times and generated the seed phrase so many times that we did notice some words reappearing twice or I think even three times in a single valid seed phrase. Um, the other big change that we made from initial rounds of testing was um, improving the password mechanics. Um, so at first, uh, we had asked you to enter your password every time you open the extension. Um, and what you see on the left there is the welcome screen. Every time you open the extension, you had to enter your password. Um, and then every time the extension closed, we would automatically lock it. And as engineers developing this, um, this flow would ensure this ensured security, and we thought the little bit of overhead to enter your password every time um, was fine. Um, but then we were testing this as a team. Uh, literally, everyone was complaining about how annoying this was. And so, um, you know, no matter how small the sample size, if everyone is telling you the same thing, uh, you listen. Um, so a small group of us regrouped, I think John, Zane, and I, um, and we talked about, um, um, we asked ourselves, like, what do we really need this password for? Um, what do we use it for? And when do we need it? Um, and we realized that a lot of the information displayed on the wallet you can find on the Block Explorer. Um, so um, there was really no need to lock everything. Um, but we do need the password to decrypt and derive your private key when sending transactions. Um, so we. So we moved the password um, collection to the token transaction screen, which is what you see on the right here. Um, and this, to me, is a really good example of how product and engineering work together. Um, when we talk things, th talk things through, um, we can come up to really great solutions to some of the problems that we face. Um, excuse me, just a question about the password. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed when you said the last bit required a 16, Character password, um, and I'm using like eight character with MetaMask. I'm just wondering what the uh, choice was. I know it's better security having a longer password, um, but I'm just wondering like why they chose such a long password length. Yeah, it was it was something um, suggested to us by Hellborn, which is our auditing uh, uh, company. Um, so it's 16. 16, they said, was um, a good length, and yeah, every extra character that you add does add to the complexity of being able to guess um, that password. But there are like other ways to calculate um, the strength of a password, which, and, you, which you might implement down the line. And how do you feel about the trade-off for uh, like user friction having such a long password compared to other um, 
wallets they might be used to, like MetaMask? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think, I mean, for me, I think a lot of users appreciate kind of the extra security that, you know, that provides. Um, and we, I don't think we've heard too much feedback about it yet, um, but I think it's something to consider as well. Um, so the final stage is the launch. Um, finally, we had our launch day. Um, it was a big coordination between multiple engineering teams, the infra team, marketing team. And our first launch day of Cobalt was May 4th, which also happens to be Star Wars Day. May the force be with you. Um, so the initial launch of Cobalt was on public testnet. And internally, we had taken guesses on how many downloads we would get on the initial day and also in the following weeks. Um, and we really weren't sure how it would perform. So you, as you see here, there's a range of guesses. A lot of them are in the double digits. Um, but if I remember correctly, I think Jofra, Ben, or Zane were closest to the actual numbers. Um, so it was an exciting day for all of us and even more exciting to see the community's reaction and how engaged they are. They were with Cobalt. Um, so finally, what's next for Cobalt and what are we thinking about now? Um, so we want to add to Cobalt's capabilities and this is kind of a list of things we're thinking about. Uh, so we want to add support for forger staking. Um, this would allow our side chains to be um, a lot more decentralized. We also want to add support for the EVM side chain, uh, which the team is uh, hard at work on, and also just multiple side chain support in general. Uh, we also want to add capabilities for multiple key pair generation, being able to spend unconfirmed change, and support for multi-signature transactions. Um, we're also looking at or thinking about adding uh, support for the main chain and also um, exploring this idea of endogenous side chains. These are side chains that would have their own native token. Um, so instead of using Zen as the transaction token, um, it would use that native token for transaction fees. Um, we're also thinking about ways to make COBOL easier to use. So, you know, we've been paying attention and looking at uh, feedback, both from the community and from our team internally as well. Um, and we're, we're, um, we want to think of ways to be able to reduce any points of friction. We also want to support a mobile app version of Cobalt. Um, and we also want to make Cobalt easy um, and friendly to users who may not be as uh, familiar with Web3 or blockchain. Um, so we're thinking of ways of um, enhancing the design, perhaps to be more Web 2-like, um, so to make it more intuitive uh, to a larger audience. And really the goal is to increase COBOL downloads and increase COBOL usage. Um, so when we ask again in the future, what is COBOLT? Um, we want to be able to say that COBOL is Horizon's first web wallet extension, um, and it supports multiple blockchains in the ecosystem. Um, so thank you for following the journey of Cobalt with me, and I'm happy to answer any questions or address any comments that you may have.